गुरूर ब्रह्मा गुरूर विष्णु गुरूर देवो महेश्वर गुरुरेव परम ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरु नम आई स्टार्टेड टू से समथिंग अबाउट थॉम्बर्ग एंड द टेरो and one of the first things that interested me about his take on tarot now tomberg did a meditations on the tarot a journey into christian mysticism um in which he uh really does a masterful job of retrieving the catholic theology that's contained in tarot now the way i'm coming at it is like this i have never had any interest in tarot but um what i am interested in is i'm interested in uh the name and form of god and i'm interested in how people have passed down uh, stories from scripture or oral traditions for thousands and thousands of years and uh used iconography or sacred art to uh, transmit even the complex theological propositions amazing doctrines amazing uh, abstract concepts actually they find ways to to draw and paint and sculpt things that are uh, esoteric and abstract and uh, incorporeal and they can actually transmit information about such things through wood or stone or ink so this has amazed me and how it is possible for someone to create something thousands of years ago that has in it a doctrine or a concept that someone like myself thousands of years later and in a totally different culture can look at it and get it actually understand what was being communicated by that name or form so um back to tomberg my understanding based on comparison of uh vaishnava and shaivite and buddhist traditions uh and ancient mediterranean and north african traditions is that when people didn't read they learned the stories from the scriptures or the sacred sacred stories and they learned doctrines and all manner of things through the sacred art that they would encounter in temples and shrines um and in people's homes whatever they would encounter sacred art they would encounter it on amulets they'd encounter it on coins and seals and other miniatures and they would encounter encounter it in gigantic form in monumental stone sculpture and um other ways so for example the great cathedrals uh or the ancient temples when a pilgrim came to anchor wat for instance or anchor tom um the walls into the city and out of the city have the body of uh Ananta Sheshanaga who is like Vasuki um used to churn uh Mount Mandara in the story of the churning of the milk ocean uh in Shrimad Bhagavatam this is a Vaishnava scripture so this churning now the uh the mountain is like a like a spindle for turning milk the milk ocean you get the the idea connection there 
and uh, the body of Vasuki, or or Anata Shishinaga in another form, is wrapped around, and on one side the devas, the 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 demigods or the devas, the godly. I prefer to call them the godly. On one side are pulling, on the other side the ungodly are pulling, and in this. Now think about this. This is the chaos before creation. And the godly and the ungodly are perturbing, you know, perturbation of the cosmic uh, chaos before order. And uh, they're pulling, like, um, what's that game? Tug of rope. Tug, tug of war, yeah, tug of war, where they're tugging on either side. But uh, the Lord and Antishesha in this form as the great serpent is circled around Mandara Mountain in the middle. So when they pull, they're they're spinning Mandara Mountain. So the whole temple city is on this scheme. And the wall coming in and the wall going out has got the body of, of Ananta on the wall in relief. And on the one side of the city are the devas holding the body of Ananta. And on the other side of the, of the city coming out are the Asuras, the, the, the ungodly holding the body of Ananta. And they're turning, and so the whole mountain of the sacred city uh, uh, is, is a, a Mount Mandara, Mount Meru. Uh, um, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, what, what Egyptian city is? Are these well, no, no, this is Angkor Wat and Angkor Tom. Angkor Wat. Okay. Yeah. So now the reason when I'm mentioning this is, is because it can be something as tiny as an, a little tiny uh, protective amulet worn on a Jewish soldier's, you know, neck. Or it can be something as huge as a whole city or a whole, an entire country plan based on the cosmic body of Purusha, right? So in this particular temple city, which is the largest Vishnu temple in the world, you know, it's, it's a Buddhist site, right? But it's a Vishnu temple. So the whole schematic of the entire thing is the, the cosmic axis Monday mountain with, you know, Lord Vishnu on top and the turning of the milk ocean and the, the, the godly and the ungodly and the contest, you know, and, and in, the, in, the, uh, in the disturbance, in the, in the contest, in the strife between the godly and the ungodly. Of course, all these, all these amazing things are developed, but what happens before the Somaras, before the nectar of immortality is, it appears? Before that appears, the struggle of the godly and the ungodly produce halahala, which is the collective sins of the universe. I'm getting off on a tangent here. Okay, just write Tomberg down for me so I come back to Tomberg. And I'm not going to give you this because this hole is so amazing here. But you know Lord Shiva appears to drink the halahala. Okay, so I'll, I'll go... The Jesus vinegar. Oh, yeah. Oh, writers. my gosh. It's so writers. amazing. So amazing. So, now, uh, back to Tomberg. So I'm giving examples of how uh, the stories of the scriptures would be carved in stone at these ancient temple sites. They'd be in reliefs, they'd be painted on the walls, they'd be everywhere. And in Nama Rupa way so that people could see, understand, just by looking at the picture they could read the stories. It's like comic books for illiterate people, you know, graphic novels. We still have graphic novels for illiterate people. Anyway, so, uh, I've got a huge amount of background on how pilgrims would travel in the Buddhist lands, in the Vaishnava lands, in the Shaivite lands, and every, all these different lands, how in the ancient times people would go to these sacred places and they would learn the stories associated with the sacred places. And they would take those stories back with them. Now, how would they take those stories back with them? They can't carry a two-ton chunk of granite. So how do you suppose they took these stories back with them? Drawing them. Really yeah. They, saw them. yeah. they drew them. And, and uh, not only did they try to draw them on any little piece of skin or any little 
bit of anything that they could put something on. But the uh, people who lived in the big temple cities, there would be artists who would make basically, uh, you know, like they have tour tourist postcards. junk, you know, <laughs> postcards. They would make uh, things. Now, here's the other thing. When pilgrims are going around to Vaishnava temples or Shavit temples in India, there are several practices that are associated. One is, like, say, for instance, someone says, oh, you know, I'm praying to have a child, or uh, I'm praying for, for the healing of my mother, or I'm praying for this, that, or something else. Or the person's committed a sin or something, and the priest says to them, I'm prescribing you a tapasya, penance. So I want you to make a pilgrimage. Or a student, you know, a student goes to the master and says, Master, teach me about Hecate. And the master says, well, there's only one place you can learn about Hecate. You have to go down there to that temple, way, way down there. It's going to take you a thousand miles. It's going to you know, take you two years to walk there. You have to go over this and under that and around this and through there. It's the quest, right? So you're going to go learn about that. Now, when people made it, they actually got there as proof that they fulfilled their quest that the master sent them on or their penance that they were prescribed because of some crime or sin that they had committed or whatever the case was uh, or for a special blessing or whatever they would often get tattooed they would often get branded I mean hot brands you know um, or they would take now this is interesting too the clay from the particular river they're gonna, you know, you're gonna go dip in the confluence of the uh, uh, the Kali Gandaki or whatever. You're gonna go to the Kali Gandaki. You're gonna pick up a a, a, a shila, a sacred shila stone from the Kali Gandaki. Say, uh, say you go to some other river. You're gonna pick up that characteristic clay that's just like that. It's only that you know that only that river's got that clay on that bottom, that gray clay or that white clay or whatever that color that red clay is. And that's going to be the tilak clay. So it's interesting, like your river of baptism, you take that clay from that bank. And every morning when you renew your baptismal bow, you know, you, you consecrate the, the, the water. And then you rub the clay in the water. So now you've made the clay, it's like the river, from, you know, it's wet clay again, right? Reconstituted it in the sacred river because you've, you've performed the patra, the, the, the rites, to consecrate the water. You've asked the Ganga or the, or the Yamuna or whatever sacred river, the Jordan, to come into that little drop of water that you're gonna wet your clay with, right? And then you mark your body 12 places the temple of, as the temple of the Holy Spirit in memory of your, your vows, your baptism. So all these different kinds of processes uh, are associated with, um, uh, with pilgrimage for whatever reason as a votive offering or for a crime or a sin to penance to pasya or a, a, a student going someplace to learn a particular thing and um, so sometimes the actual image would be put on the person's body that was my point of bringing that one up now um, at all these great places of pilgrimage, you know, there's huge markets around these gigantic places of pilgrimage. Thousands of vendors selling their whatever, produce or whatever. Well, there are also going to be people who, who draw the icons that you see in the temple. Now, instead of a person going and sitting in front of the icon and trying to draw it themselves. People could buy, just like you can go any place today, Buddhist lands, uh, Vaishnava or, or Shakti or Shaivite temples. What, what are you going to go find when you go there to the marketplace? You're going to see images of the images in the temple. Even images that you're not ever supposed to see that are in the temple. <laughs> You know, the, the uh, hidden images. They know, the devotees know what the hidden images look like, and they have images of them, and you can buy them outside the temple, you know. 
But anyway, you know, if you go to the uh, go to Vatican City for the uh, something birthday of the Pope or something, you can get a Pope on a, a coffee mug. <laughs> anyway, uh, when a person would make the pilgrimage round, they go from shrine to shrine to shrine to shrine to shrine. They would collect these little tiny bits or scraps of stuff that had these different drawings on them. And sometimes they would collect the same ones and sometimes people collect all different ones. So basically when they got back home or when they were on pilgrimage or whatever, when it was meditation time, when it was prayer time, they don't get out their breviary, they don't get out their Bible, they get out their little little slat satchel of cards, little keepsakes, you know, might be a little stone from the Kali Gandaki. They take out their little, like the like the Native Americans, you got your little satchel full of sacred stuff, your little f bird feather that you found on a particular time and a, this pebble that you got here. My dad, he's so amazing. We were going through a box of stuff last night and this little tiny white pebble fell out and it had an M and an E on it. And dad says, oh, he says, that's really important. I said, why is he packed this little tiny white pebble that's got M and E written on it? He says, that, that was, uh, I guess he was on the beach or something. He says, that was the day that I found out that Mindy had had her baby Emery, her first son, Emery. So that's my Mindy and Emery stone. So it's like that. So a Native American might have his little medicine pouch that he's got all of his important little tiny things in. And a pilgrim in Europe might have their deck of pilgrim's cards. Little scratchings and etchings and pictures and things like that. Now, for great cathedrals that are there for a thousand years or more, great temple sites, uh, people would eventually, like how many people have been to Mecca? How many people have ever been to the Temple of Venkateshwa in, in South India? Millions and millions and millions of people have been there. So how many people have ever been to uh, Chartres or Our Lady of Notre Dame? These, these great places of pilgrimage. So eventually what you have is you have certain almost standardized sets of these little cards or little little, uh, um, what, are they, what do we call them? I still call them, you know. Prayer cards. Prayer cards, yeah, prayer cards. That's what they are. You know, they got a picture of a saint on one side and they have the prayer on the other side, right? The Catholics still have them. And somebody have a whole a huge collection of them. But anyway, that's the origin of the tarot. And I was absolutely certain of it. So when I, when I first took an interest in tarot, I was looking at all these nutty, during the 1960s, all these friends doing this tarot stuff, all this kind of stuff. And I thought, you know, that has nothing to do with it. All this kind of hooey. This was a, this was a theological teaching tool. They, they, they learned stories from the Bible. They learned theological precepts. They learned moral theology. They learned all kinds of things. But it wasn't a prognostication, you know. And what struck me about the tarot, the more I looked into it, is it's used by people that are really have an anti-Catholic or pagan stance, but the right. story is completely in line with Catholic theology. Exactly. And so their Bible is teaching something that they vehemently oppose intellectually. Yeah. So in a sense. Yeah. yeah. So when I when I when Richard Payne introduced me to uh, Tomberg's. Uh, meditations on the tarot from the very first pages I said this guy knows he he understands that this is actually a theological teaching tool that this goes back into into Catholic Europe and he's re, he's actually recovered this and that's what he's using it for I, I was amazed I was thrilled and of course I of course I can recognize all that um, uh, Rudolf Steiner stuff in there all that anthroposophical but you know he he's he transcends it, has transcends it so much throughout there that I kind of I kind of forgive him for the the theosophical and anthropoth anthroposophy stuff that's still in there because he's so great the rest of it is such a great great work and then see Richard actually 
was chosen to publish it. And uh, he had the publishing rights to it. And uh, the, uh, the restriction was that it could not be published until 20 years after his death. 